Good afternoon and welcome back to CS240. This is the introduction to computer systems. And we have been making great progress on moving through our operating system or our systems foundation. So, so far we have finished up talking about data and you learned how to represent data with hexadecimal, how to do UTF-8 encoding, what ASCII is. And we talked about the CPU where you learned about logic gate. You learned about creating logical expressions. And you learned how a computer actually does things like addition and multiplication. And we are just about finished up talking about memory. So there's one last topic that I want to mention in memory before we finish up the memory foundation. And this is more a meta level topic about memory. So we have to take everything we know so far about memory to really understand fragmentation. And fragmentation is a really, really simple concept. So fragmentation is simply the idea that we call anything fragmentation when there is an inefficient use of memory resulting in a waste of space um, and or performance. So anything that we do that ends up being an inefficient use of memory, we classify as a type of memory fragmentation. So this is going to be a broad class of different things. And generally, when we study fragmentation, we're going to study it from the view of the operating system. So from the view of the operating system, so both of these things, I'm going to say this is the view from the operating system. So this is a different view than you normally are taking. Because normally, you think of yourself as a programmer. And you're thinking about the view of a process from the programmer's perspective. But we're actually going to take on the view from the operating system. So what that means is the view from the operating system means that the internal and external is almost backwards from what we expect. So internal fragmentation is going to be fragmentation that is internal to decisions made by the operating system. So internal fragmentation, I'm going to basically be internal decisions by the operating system. So in the most common form of, ex of internal fragmentation is the fragmentation caused by our paging system scheme. So internal fragmentation is generally going to be caused by, I'm going to say, caused by the overallocation of memory. by the OS. So we've talked about this idea that pages, that basically you can think of an entire, your entire memory as a one big book. And if you think about your entire memory as a book, you can flip to a given page in a book, and every single page has 4,096 characters. That's exactly how our memory is organized. We have a big book of memory, and we have various different pages. We have a page table that translates where those pages go from for each process in its own virtual page table and where that ends up in physical RAM. So we have this idea of this page table and this idea of the this idea that we always allocate things in 4096 bytes. So we always have these four kilobytes allocation. So even if my process only needs 10 bytes, I'm going to give it an entire page. So this is a form of internal fragmentation. We've made a decision in our operating system that we're going to give out chunks of 4096 at a time because it makes it way, way easier to organize everything. So this is internal. This is a decision to the operating system. Now, once we give you that memory, once you increase the size of the heap, and this is actually what you're working on in MP3, we also have external fragmentation. So this is external to the operating system and is basically internal to your own program. So external fragmentation... So external by the OS, or external to the OS, we'll say. External fragmentation is going to be caused by small unusable holes caused by small unusable holes 
in allocated regions of memory. So notice that these are two different problems that we could tackle with two different solutions. Internal fragmentation is this idea that we split our memory into pages of four kilobytes, and we're giving out four kilobytes at a time, and there's always going to be some amount of memory probably left over at the end of the four kilobyte region. That is internal fragmentation, and we waste some memory by doing paging. Hopefully it's a really tiny amount of memory, but there is some wasted memory. External fragmentation is the idea that once we as programmers get the memory, we're going to end up creating holes with our malloc implementation. So if we look at an example, here is what a program might look like after running a small amount of time. We have the start of the heap at the very bottom, and I'm growing the start of the heap from the bottom, from low addresses up to high addresses, which is exactly how heap memory is going to grow. And after this program runs for a while, I realize that I have this allocated region right at the beginning of the heap. I have this block, and what I've done is I've made bold blocks around 4096 chunks. So what we have is we have this as one page. This is a second page. And here's a third page. So these are pages of memory by your operating system. And here we actually see both types of fragmentation. Because this program needed just over two pages worth of memory to do its tasks. So what we have up here is we have this unallocated region. This has actually been assigned to a particular process because we needed another page of memory. But this particular process hasn't done anything with it. So this is a form of internal fragmentation. On the other hand, we have written a malloc, malloc algorithm. Our malloc algorithm to manage the heap memory has made some decisions that resulted in a hole being right in the middle of our heap. So we have a small hole, actually a pretty large hole right here, that we're not using. This memory is complete, sitting completely idle. No one has a pointer to this memory. This is more wasted space. And this wasted space is in a form of external fragmentation. So as we look at a system, we can look at what memory is wasted by the design decisions that we make. And based on the design decisions we make, we can identify what type of fragmentation there is and why we don't just have this continuous block of memory. So any questions on fragmentation? Yeah, Aaron. So when we increase the heap, we actually don't necessarily, we won't ask for it. I mean, you could ask for it in terms of pages. But when we make a call to sbreak, which, which is our interface into the heap, when we say sbreak, we can S break of 100. That's totally valid to say S break of 100. That's something that you have probably written in your MP3 code. What it's going to do internally is it's going to say, do I need another page to satisfy that 100 byte request? If I need another page, it's going to go fetch that page from the operating system. If I don't need another page, it's going to just reuse some of that unallocated space it has left over on the page it currently has. So S-break has some intelligence inside of it to decide if it needs another page. Any other questions? So we're not going to spend too much time analyzing memory. But you can spend, there is whole areas of study, of research, of what's the most efficient way to minimize internal and external fragmentation. So this is an area that you can really nerd out with. But at this point, if there's no questions, we're going to leave memory behind. You're going to still get to understand it a little bit more through working on MP3. But we're going to finish talking about memory as an idea. And we're going to move on to our fourth foundation. 
And we're going to spend just 10 minutes on our fourth foundation, if even that. So fourth foundation is really the most, um, the most broad foundation and covers just millions and millions of different devices. And in fact, I cared so little about this foundation, I don't even have a slide for this foundation. So this fourth foundation is the idea that we have computer peripherals in our computer. And our computer peripheral is going to be every other piece of hardware that's not the CPU and not memory or storage. So this includes, so, and every single interface is going to be managed by the operating system. So every interface is managed by the operating system. So the operating system is going to provide us a way to talk to all of our different peripheral devices. And the way the operating system manages it is the manufacturers of the peripheral devices have to build these things that we call device drivers. And device drivers are a code that runs in the operating system that tells the operating system how to communicate with that particular device. And the beautiful thing about peripherals is they handle everything else that the computer does. So there are just a ton of peripherals out there. So what is something a computer does that's not just your CPU and memory? What is other hardware attached to your computer? Yeah. Yeah, we've got, um, we have video devices. So this might be your GPU. This might be your monitor. This might be however you actually get video out from your computer. So okay, we've got the GPU. Aaron, yeah. We have the keyboard and mouse. So keyboard and mouse. But honestly, I would say I actually don't interact with a computer with keyboard and mice as much as I interact with computers with another thing. How do you interact with the computer device you probably use the most? The yeah, the screen. So touch. Some haptic device. You're actually touching screens more often than you're kind of typing often. So we actually call these in general um, uh, human interface devices or HIDs. H-I-D is a term you've seen or you might see. Um, so these are any device that interacts with a human. So it's a human interface devices. So how do you actually interact with a computer? Is it a mouse? Is it a keyboard? Is it a touch? Is it a stylus pen? They're all slightly different ways and they're all peripherals to the computer. All right, so we have, we have the graphics card. We have human interface devices like mouse and keyboard. Yeah. Camera. Oh, so yeah, we have cameras. So cameras, microphones, so basically everything that records the environment around it. So there's, we have microphones, we have cameras, we have other devices that might record things. I, my cell phone tracks how many steps I take. Like there is some recording device happening there. Yeah. Say what? Speakers. Yeah, so we have audio. Sound. So some computers have the audio just as a task that the CPU does. Some have dedicated audio hardware. You can get audio, um, audio cards, just like you can get video cards, if you really care about audio. So there's a, these are great. There's at least one more that I'm thinking is something you use every single moment that you're using a device almost. Another peripheral. Yeah. Say what? Vans? Vans? Oh, fans, sorry. So I'm going to actually, I mean, there are smart fans that the CPUs can regulate. Generally, I, I mean, maybe fans have drivers. Generally, they kind of are on when they get too hot and off. I, I'm sure there are smart fans out there, but fans are maybe one. Um, fans are weird because the CPU, if, the, uh, if the CPU doesn't control it, it's not really a peripheral. So if we have just fan, most fans I've built this on computers I've built, the fan just goes. Yeah. 
Yeah, so networking, that's a huge one. Networking, so all of your modems. So here in this laptop right here, this is a dumb laptop in the sense it only has Wi-Fi. So it uses a protocol called 802.11 to communicate data. My cell phone, it doesn't, it has Wi-Fi, but it also has 3G, 4G, whatever G radios that communicate with cellular towers as well. And then the computer here in this podium actually has a physical wire called an 802.3 Ethernet connection that is communicating with the rest of the world. So there's a whole bunch of different things that are communicating with the world through various forms of networking. And what the operating system does is it makes all of these computer peripherals interface with the program itself. So we'll look a little bit more about this as we dive deeper into the operating system and how it does this and this idea of a hardware abstraction layer. But as a programmer, all we say is when we want to send a network packet, we're going to do in C, so as part of MP5, you're going to program sending a network packet over a socket. And in MP5, you're going to do socket bind listen accept and then send and receive. You're going to make these six different system calls to actually send data over the network. And this data that you're sending over the network is, is going to work no matter if you're running on an Ethernet cable or a Wi-Fi cable. So the operating system makes sure that each one of these classes of devices just work without the programmer having to think of it. So this is peripherals. It's all the other awesome things our computer does we're going, you may one day program your own peripheral. You may make a new sensor that does something amazing. But there's millions of them out there, and all of them have a lot of very specific logic. So we're not going to talk about any one of them in detail. We'll talk about how the operating system is going to manage some of them so that all network cards have a similar interface, so it doesn't matter if you're sending data over a modem, over Wi-Fi or over an Ethernet cable, you still can send the data. But we're not going to dive in depth at any one of these peripherals. And neither does any other CS course that I know of. They're just so specialized that you'll learn, if you end up working on a peripheral, you'll learn how that particular peripheral works. And I'm going to guess in 10 years, there's going to be peripherals that are very commonplace that aren't even listed here now. There are always new types of devices. One thing that's kind of graphics is there's virtual reality now. That wasn't even a thing 10 years ago. There's AR and VR headsets. Those are now peripherals that weren't peripherals 10 years ago. So any question on peripherals? That was the quickest foundation. All right, now let's get talking to what I start, what I really love about this course. And I love threads. So threads are going to be the thing that we are going to spend the next, really like five lectures talking about. Threads enable so much to happen, and this is what makes the biggest difference of you as a programmer between what you know in 225 and what you're going to know two weeks from now. Because threads are this amazing thing that actually is the execution unit of your program. So I want to talk about a few different terminologies around threads. So the first, threads is this execution unit. Threads is the thing that actually does the work. And what we often will talk about is we don't talk about programs as a thread. Instead, we talk about programs as a process. So a process is an organization of one or more threads in the same context. A really simple process, and most of the programs you've built so far, actually only have a single thread. So a process may have one or more threads, but simple programs only have a single thread. And the single thread that you have 
is the initial thread of your program. And we actually call this initial thread the main thread. And this is called the main thread because this thread begins in the main function. This is the only thread that gets created for you that you don't have to do any work to create. This thread comes from the operating system to your program, and this is how we initialize, we initially start running your program. Is when the operating system is commanded that it wants to run this executable, it's going to load the executable in memory, and it's going to set the program counter for the thread that's running that executable to the beginning of main. And that's where your program begins. Every other thread after that is going to have to be threads that we create ourselves. So threads can be both an amazing thing and a complete pain. Because I think I've heard from Challen that all of you guys are expert Android programmers. Is that right? Did he lie to me? Oh, expert might be a little much. Eh, maybe he exaggerated. Maybe I'm remembering wrong. But how many of you guys, so how many of you guys have written at least a, a 125 Android app? How many of you guys have written an Android app at least once? Yeah, okay, so are, is, is there some 125 that's not doing Android or do you not do 125 here? You didn't take 125? So if you did an Android app, how many of you guys got an error where you tried to do a blocking operation on the, main, on the UI thread? You remember that? Was that a total pain? Yeah, yeah, there's lots of things that comes up in that you basically have. So you remember that. Does anyone else remember kind of that? Did anyone else see that error? Yeah, Matt, you saw the same thing? And it's kind of, yeah, go ahead, sorry. So you're kind of Googling around like, oh, this is error message. Because I remember the little bit of Android programming I did. I was like, oh my gosh, this is the worst. Because like all I want to do is like read a file that's only two bytes long. Like why can't I do that? And the idea is threads are the executable unit. And you've seen threads before. Every single Android application is made up of tens or hundreds of threads. And threads generally manage one thing each. So in Android, you have the UI thread, and that's designed to update the user interface. Um, in C programs, you start out with just the main thread. But if you want to take advantage of your full computer, as programmers, we need to use multiple threads. Because every single thread runs code, but every single one of you have devices that have more than one CPU inside of them. So if you're running a single threaded application, you're only taking advantage of a single CPU. So we want to be able to actually make our program run as fast as possible. We want to have all of the CPUs in our system working together. Or you may want to delegate different tasks that can run in parallel, no matter how many different CPUs we have. So if we want to create multiple units of execution that are running at the same time, within our program, we have to create new threads. And in C, there's a library called pthread that allows us to create a new thread. And this is the most disgusting C function we're going to look at. Because this is the prototype for the function. And I look at this prototype, and I'm like, OK, P thread T star thread. Okay, I get this. This is a P thread T pointer. It's a pointer to some type of structure. This underscore T is this is um, basically the C syntax for type. So when you see underscore T, you can read that as basically type. So this is a P thread type. So the P thread type pointer. Okay. Then a P thread attribute pointer. Okay, I'm okay with this. Void star, star start routine, void what? This is just disgusting. 
So we'll skip over that for a second. And the last one is a void pointer. We know void pointers. Void pointers are fun. So this start routine, this third argument that goes into the pthread create function is going to be the function that starts running once the thread is created. So basically, your start routine for your entire program for the main thread is the main function. The start routine for the thread you're creating has to be of type void star star start routine void star. And what that basically means is this says that I have to be of type. This accepts a function that is a void star pointer to any function name that takes in a void star as an argument. So this type, all it says is I am passing a function pointer into my pthread create function. And the pthread create function, every single function, you're, every single line of code that you're writing that creates a new thread, the thing that it's actually creating, the program that you're calling, has to be a function that returns a void star and takes in a single argument that's a void star. We can call this function whatever we want, but it has to be of type void star, some function name, void star. So that means it's going to have a return type of whatever you want, and you can pass in whatever you want. You just have to be really, 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 really careful. Because you can cast void stars to anything and from anything. So it's saying, I will return a pointer, and you can pass in a pointer. I'm not going to give you any type safety at all. But you can only pass in one pointer. So if you want to pass two things into a struct, you have to pass two pointers in. So this is how we create new threads. We're going to call pthread create. I'm going to give it four parameters. We're going to give it a thread ID. Um, structure, we're going to give it a pthread structure that we'll pass in. We'll always end up being, so for the purpose of 225, or sorry, 240, I don't think we do anything but null in the second argument. And third and fourth arguments are basically about the function call, the last one, void star arg, that's what actually is going to get passed into the void star when it calls, when it creates your thread. So I think looking at this in abstract makes sense to some of you, but I think a lot of you would rather see an example. So if we flip the sheet over, let's look at some code. So any questions before we dive into code? What's a void pointer? Oh, great question. So void, so you're familiar with a void uh, return type, right? So void returns types have no return type. A void pointer says I'm going, it's a pointer that has no explicit type. So it's basically a pointer, it has a memory address. It does not tell us what's at the other end of the memory address. We don't know if it's an integer. We don't know if it's a double. We don't know if it's a structure. We don't know anything about it. So any other questions? Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah. It, it basically simply means that we're going to give the name of a function as an argument. And we'll see that in the example of the code. And in fact, if we look right here, this is the third argument in pthread create, that thread start is actually the name of this function right here. So it's always just going to match up the name. Yeah? No, you can use it in main. Yeah, I can throw, I can send, I can, Call thread start. It's just an ordinary function. Yeah. So here is our very first program that uses threads. And I'm going to jump to, every time I see a program, I'm going to jump to main. That's the starting point. 
And so line 13 is just main, line 14 is a comment, line 15, int i, I'm just declaring my looping variable, 16, p thread t, t id, so I'm just calling it the thread id, this is a common syntax you're going to see a lot, and I'm going to create a bunch of thread structures, specifically I'm going to create num thread structures, and that's 15. So I'm going to create 15 thread structures to store my thread identifiers. And then on line 16, or, or sorry, line 17, I have my for loop, and line 18, for every single p thread structure, I'm creating a thread. So I'm passing in thread ID at i, which is an array, it takes in a pointer, so I'm taking the memory address of it. Null is my second parameter. My third parameter needs to be the name of a void star, void star function. Let's see if thread star is void star, void star. If I jump up to line seven, it is void star, void star. So it's the correct signature. And then the thing I'm going to pass into this is I'm going to pass in the number, my looping variable i as a pointer. So i is an integer, so I need to dereference it to make it a pointer. And I'm going to cast as a void star to avoid compiler warnings. So I'm passing an integer pointer as a void star. And if you notice, as I pass this in, the first thing I do on line eight is when I receive that void pointer back, I'm casting it back to an integer. Just because the thing I'm passing is integer, the thing I want to actually use it as an integer, so basically it just has to go to a void star as it's being shipped from my thread creation to the actual thread running. Because void star is the only thing we get to pass around. And then we have, um, I have a nice little print statement that um, prints thread whatever numbers in i is running. And then I go ahead and exit the thread by returning null. So knowing what you know now, what does this code, what do we expect this code to do? Okay, we expect thread 0 to thread 14 to print out all, um, to show all 15 threads are running, and then done at the end? Yeah. Then done at the end. Aaron thinks differently. Oh, so we have 15 individual execution units. We never said anything about them being ordered. So Aaron thinks we might actually see like seven print out first, then one, then zero, then nine. And it could be any jumble of order. Because we basically have now these 16 threads all running at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So are you limited in the number of CPUs you have on your computer as the number of threads you can run at the same time? You are limited in the number of threads you can run at identically the same time. But what will happen if you, only, if you have 16 threads, because we have 15 extra threads in main, what will happen is if I have a four core machine, I'm going to run four of them at the same time for just like a millisecond, then swap over to another four. So to us as humans, it's going to look like it's all at the same time because they run so quick. But yes, you are physically limited to however many cores you have. But they but will swap between them very, very quickly. Yeah. Do all the share so do all the threads share the same programming memory? They they share the same heap, but they all have their own stack and their own program counter. So every single version of um, the so once you're inside the thread, every single thread has its own private version of thread start. But all of the other program memory is completely shared. So all of your heap variables are shared between all of your threads. So they share all of their memory except for the stack of the code that they're actually running. Any other thoughts before we actually look at this program? All right, then let's go, I'm gonna go ahead and um, pull up VS Code which I already have running, and let's, so here is thread, 15threads.c, 
So this is the program that we have. Same exact code as you have on your sheet. And I'm going to just go, I'm going to CD 07, because we're in the 07 directory. GCC um, 15 threads.c. And it's going to give me a warning that says it does not know what pthread create is. And that is because when you compile codes with threads, C requires an additional library. So we're going to do minus LP thread. So we're generally going to have a make file provided for this for you. But I just want you to see that everything I'm doing, I'm just using GCC. I'm just compiling this code. I'm not doing anything fancy. There's no make file that's hiding all the logic. I just need to do GCC, um, the program name dot C minus LP thread. That's going to create an A dot out. So let's go ahead and run dot slash a dot out. Oh, intriguing. I see thread one running, thread two, thread three, thread four, all the way up to thread 14. So, hmm. There's something, there's a few strange things with this output. What is strange? Yeah. Yeah, where in the world did thread zero go? That's a really, really good question. Let me run this again. This is actually a wild output. I did not expect this. Really, computer? You are, oh, oh. Okay, now we're getting something interesting. What's happening here? So what we see is, we see that Aaron's idea, that they're not necessarily in the same order, came true, right? That these threads are in 16 independent little things that are running all at the same time. So whichever one gets scheduled first by the operating system to run, is going to be the thing that's going to run next. Generally, they're roughly going to be in the order that they're created, but you have no guarantees at all. So we have thread one, two didn't run until way down here. So we had one, three, four, five, seven, eight, then two, then six ran. But what I find really interesting is we still don't have a thread zero. And not only do we not have a thread zero, when I look down at the bottom, I have this very, very strange thing happening right here. I have thread 15 thread 15 running dot dot dot. What happened at that moment? What do we expect that might have happened? Yeah, we have two threads that are trying to run at exactly the same moment. And both tried to write to the same shared resource. This is something we actually call a race condition that we're going to study a lot. We have two things accessing one shared buffer, and they kind of overrode each other. And here we still don't have a zero. Here we don't even have a 15 either. So here we have no thread 0, no thread 15. And I'm going to run this and see if I can get. OK, here is what I was hoping to see. So here, after done, I see two thread 15 running. How in the world did I get thread 15 running twice? We have each thread's printing out one print statement, but thread 15's running twice. And in fact, thread 0 did not run at all. Yeah, you have an idea? Did, did we ask two threads to launch and two cores at, grabbed it at the same time so that we got two of them? 
So the computer is going to protect us against that. So we don't have two 15s running. But I do like this idea. Like there is definitely some sort of race condition. There's definitely something happening. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, this is actually really interesting. So if we look at the code, what's happening is we have this idea that we have a single integer i inside of our main function, right? We are passing that same integer pointer to all 15 threads, right? So there's just a single four bytes of memory that has i into it. And we're changing that value from three to four. And at this moment in time, at line eight, we're checking out what is in i. Usually, if we run the, if the thread gets created right when we call pthread create, it's going to grab that i. But if the program takes a little bit, if the computer takes a little bit longer to decide to schedule that thread, like if my computer was really, really busy, and there's lots of things competing for the CPU, when I create a new thread, it may not get to run immediately. And so the value of i might actually be totally disconnected from what the value of i was when I started the thread, because that, the memory that I'm pointing to has changed since I called pthread create. So if I wanted to fix that, I need a different i for every single version of my thread. Because if I pass a pointer to the same memory, it's obviously going to just read what's ever in that memory. And if we're changing what's in that memory, it's not guaranteed to have uh, all the way to 15. All from 0 to 15. In fact, it's actually really interesting. On this particular computer, I basically never get printing out thread zeros running. So launching that first thread seems to take enough time that I actually launch two threads before any single thread starts running. And honestly, every single computer that runs this program runs it differently. Threads are just going to be completely determined by what the availability of the CPU is. So I run this again. I see now I have 1, 3, 2 as my order. I still don't have 0. I don't know if here I don't have thread 1 at all. So here I've got thread 7 happening twice. Because here, those two threads both ran at the exact same time when 7 had the memory of i. So I got two thre thread 7s, no thread 0s, no thread 1s, and so forth. There's one tricky thing that's hard to demonstrate because WSL actually is nice to us. But if you were to run this computer, if you were to run this code on other computers, particularly on Macs, what you'll actually often see is you print out done and nothing happens. Because pthread do not necessarily require, so programs, X, so let me say that a different way. Um, so programs will exit when the main thread exits. So programs will exit when the main thread exits. And only a few operating systems are really nice that will let threads stick around for a while after the main thread exits. So the main thread's kind of the controlling thread, and all of the other threads end up being secondary thread. I think WSL is nice. So I'm going to add like a sleep 10 inside my thread function. Actually, I'll be really mean, and I'll add it before I get the ID number. So if I add sleep 10, I should launch a thread, basically put that thread to sleep, tell it to wait for 10 seconds, and then I will actually run the thread code. If I do this, let's see what happens. Okay, it's sleep. Sleep manual page. 
All right, get the right include file. Okay, yeah, so sleeping of 10 was long enough to see what happens here. I now don't get a single thing printed out. So simply by sleeping for 10 seconds, I now see nothing printed out at all. So I would say there's three things that you should really take away from here. First, that threads will run in whatever order the CPU schedules it in. So what do you know about threads? So threads, they will run, runs in an order based on CPU scheduling. Second thing that we definitely should have taken away from here is that we that when the main thread exits, all uh, the program exits, or I'll say the process exits, the whole process exits. So if we have threads doing work, but we our main thread exits, then our whole process exits. Yeah. What's the what? What is the thing called that pthread? What's the system call? How does it actually create the thread? It asks the operating system to create the thread. Yes. Yeah, so deep inside the operating system, there is something, there's probably a call that's basically like a fork or a micro fork that says, I want a new process to be running, create a thread for me, and the operating system is going to create that thread. No, the separate, the thread is a, is within the same process as its, as its parent thread. So it's, the process is the container that actually holds all of the threads for a given process. And pro threads actually came about as being lightweight processes. So the actual system call in Linux, I think, is still fork. That you actually div do different arguments to fork in the system call, to fork a thread versus fork in a process. But it's very similar to process creation. It's basically just a lightweight process. So that's why the system call is almost certainly fork. So and the third thing, to kind of wrap up the three things we take away, is the third thing is memory between threads is shared. The only thing that's private is the actual stacks of the individual threads itself. That's the only private memory a thread has, is its own little stack on its own function. So hopefully there's three things you took away. Hopefully you, you're able to realize that threads are just ran based on a CPU scheduler. We have no control as programmers over how, when our threads are going to run. Sometimes it's going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Sometimes we're going to see a random order. We have no control over this. Second thing, as soon as the main thread exits, the entire process is going to get killed. So we got to keep our main thread alive if we want to see this happen. And third thing is we want to see uh, is all of the memory is shared. We share our memory with all of our other process buddies or all of our other thread buddies in the same process. Yeah. Is this faster than printing out process zero through 15? In the inside main, absolutely not. Because there's going to be a lot of work that takes to create a thread. So if all you're doing is printing a single thing, you're wasting a whole bunch of processing time to create that thread. Um, but if you're doing a lot of work where you can utilize multiple cores, 
if your program's taking 30 seconds to process something, you absolutely are going to gain a speed up. I mean, even if it takes one second to process something, honestly, you're going to gain a huge speed up. But if you're just printing it out, absolutely not. Matt. Would be so there's another thing that we're going to talk about next week, which is um, this idea that we have blocking calls. There are calls that a program can make that and actually we'll talk about it in just a second, because we'll see our first blocking call. But there's a lot of calls that our program's going to make that ends up waiting for the CPU to do something for us. And we're saying, hey, don't return from this function until you're done doing that. So one of them is like a network. So if you're calling an API and you're saying, hey, I want to get data from this network service, return this function when this data is available. We call this a blocking call because it blocks the execution of your program until that uh, data is ready. So we will often use threads so that we can make these blocking calls so we can request data from an API. And that thread, its entire job is to request data from the API. It'll keep running once it gets that data. But we can do other things while we're waiting for that thread to actually get data from an API. So that's where you see threads used a lot, is if you want to make a request to some resource, give it to a thread, let that thread handle making that request. Once that request is ready, then we'll handle that request. And if you think about, if any of you have programmed in JavaScript, how many of you guys have done any JavaScript programming? How many of you guys have used an async or an await call inside of JavaScript or ever seen that syntax? Yeah, so a few of you guys. So this is exactly what's happening. The await says, I'm going to run it as a thread, basically, and synchronize it. And um, it sort of handles all of this threading for you. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, await blocks. Yeah, if you have await, because you're, you literally, so if you have the await command, you don't go to the next line of code until await returns, right? So that's, a, that's the definition of a blocking call. Yeah, you're blocking that thread. The beautiful thing about async is you can actually have multiple async functions running at once. That's the kind of magic of async await. Cool. Um, so one, other, one last little thing I want to do. So I saw that if I added sleep 10, when I looked at the manual page for sleep, I saw that sleep sleeps for um, 10 seconds. So, I mean, anytime you want a, um, any documentation, if you want to go straight to the technical documentation, there used to be a system called, called manual or just man. And so if you do manual or man, whatever syscall you want, Google will know that you generally are going to want the um, system call pages for that particular command. So man sleep is the manual pages for sleep. And that comes from old school days where you actually type man inside the terminal. That's before you had Google. So I want to actually make one last change to this program. So I want to say, I want to just prove to you that the memory really is shared. So I'm going to actually add a sleep one right here. And when I add a sleep one here, it should sleep for a second before it actually grabs the value from I. But I don't want the program to die, so I'm going to add a sleep 5 after I create all the threads. So I'm going to add a sleep 1 before each thread's going to run. And then I'm going to add a sleep 5 after I create all of the threads. What do we expect to happen? Maybe what? Maybe only a few will threads will run because I'm only sleeping for five seconds, but I need to sleep for a total of 15 seconds for all the threads to run. Maybe that's, a, that's an interesting idea. So maybe only a few of the threads will run. Uh, Aaron. So Erin thinks differently in the sense that she says all 15 of these threads are going to run simultaneously. And then in all 15 threads, we'll have the value of 15 because that's what the value of i is in the sleep 5. 
So there's this interesting question. Do all the threads really run at the same time? Do they all sleep for one second simultaneously? Or do they have to rotate through sleeping? Let's see what happens. So I'm going to change this. In thread start, I have a sleep one. And after my three third create, I have a sleep five. And I'm going to go ahead and make this program. And oh, it looks like they all slept simultaneously. So I got all thread 15s running. So they all hung out for one second. They all slept at the exact same time because all 15s running at the exact same time. They all slept for one second simultaneously. They all woke up because notice after that one second, they kind of all printed all at once. So it's like one second, boom. And then four seconds after that, we finally get the done and the program exits. So this is one way we can approach actually, um, this is one way we can approach actually making sure all of our threads run. But please never, never do this. This is disgusting. We're sort of waiting around for a bunch of extra time for the programs to finish. Instead, there's one more system call that's going to help us out. And that is our good friend, pthread join. So I have a new, so I'm going to look at the next page. And I want to look at just the main function. The, everything else about this code is the same. I'm just changing the main function. The thread um, count pro, or the thread start program is exactly the same. So I just included the things that are different. So this is the new main function. So I've made a couple of um, changes. So the first change I made is notice what's happening on line 18. On line 18, I'm saying I'm going to malloc enough memory to store an integer. And I'm going to put i into that malloc memory. So if I malloc memory every single time I'm about ready to do a pthread create, now does every single um, called pthread create have its own memory? Yeah. So I've malloc enough space for an integer for each of the individual threads. So instead of passing i directly, I'm going to go ahead and put my value of i inside val, and then pass val here. So even if i changes afterwards, the actual value that's in val is the memory that I have now left only for that particular thread. So this is a common strategy that we're going to use, that if you're going to create, create data, or sorry, create multiple threads that need data, you should malloc the data that you're going to send each individual thread. So they have their own private memory. So they're all sharing the same heap. Now we just have different spots on our heap where we have information for the different threads. The second change I've made is I've introduced a new call called pthread join. So pthread join is a blocking call. What a blocking call means is the program will not continue past that line of code until the condition that the function um, needs to be satisfied has been satisfied. So this requires pthread join. The condition that has to be satisfied for pthread join to return is that the thread must have exited. So we will literally get stuck running our code at line 25. We won't get past line 25 until the thread has actually exited. So we're just going to hang out there waiting for thread 0 to finish, then waiting for thread 1 to finish, then waiting for thread 2 to finish. Because we're going to create all of these threads and then join all of these threads. So now I have individual memory for all of my threads. I'm now waiting for each thread to exit before I print out done. And what do we expect to happen now? Well, I see all the numbers 0 through 15. What? Well, I what? 
Yeah, we'll see 0 and 14, then done. Will they always be in the order 0 through 14, though? Awesome. Yeah, so I'm not specifying any order between these threads. I've created all 15 threads all at once. And then I'm letting the CPU run all 15 threads. I'm not specifying any dependencies. Yeah. Ooh, I, let's, let me run this code and then we'll change it to run that code because I think that's a fantastic question. So let's, let's not do that example quite yet, but let's go ahead and just see what does this code do? I'm gonna run this code. This function is called, this is a different one. This is 15join.c. So we don't have any sleeps anymore. That was the other program. So 15join.c, completely new file, um, has the same code as we've seen before. And now I'm gonna go ahead and do gcc 15join.c.slash a.out. And I see thread zero. I've got the thread zero finally. I see it. I actually have a thread zero. It was there all along. But we see that exactly what we expected. It was thread zero, then it was thread two, then it was thread one. So by waiting for every thread to finish, we guarantee every thread gets to run. By creating malloc memory for each thread, we guarantee the data is not being overwritten by other threads. But we do not guarantee an order at all. Thread zero might run first, or it might be thread two that runs first. Here we had zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, eight. Then we go 12, 13, 14, then 11, 10. And every time I run this program, it's gonna be a slightly different order. So here, zero, two, three, and one didn't run until the fourth thread. So it's a completely, it's effectively random. There's obviously a bias towards the order you're creating it. So zero is more likely going to run near the beginning than near the end. So you can't use it as a random number generator but you don't have any control over this. And this is what makes threaded programming really, really, really hard. You have functions that you don't know which order they're running in. But while it's really hard, it's really fun. So what if we did want to enforce an order? So um, Jake, right? Is that right? Yeah, so Jake said, what if we actually changed up the code to not have pthread? So I did something very purposefully here. So if you look, I have two separate for loops. I created all of the threads in the first for loop. Then I joined all of the threads in the second for loop. But Jake said, what if I got rid of this idea of a second for loop? What if I went into my code and simply had pthread create followed by pthread join? What happens? What do we think is going to change? Do you have ideas on what might happen, Jake? Yeah, I like this idea. So we create thread zero. We say, hey, operating system, create thread zero. Then we say, hey, operating system, make sure thread zero finishes before we do anything else. Then thread one, then thread two, then thread three. So what's actually happening, and let's compile this. And we see that we always get the order zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. No matter how many times I run it, we're always gonna get zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But there's something disgusting that just happened here with this program which is we just removed actual every bit of parallelism that we added to this program. Because now we don't have multiple threads being created and running at the same time. So if I actually add, I'm gonna add my sleep one back at the beginning of this thread start function. And uh, I don't wanna lose this for loop, so. And then I'm gonna include the include file so it doesn't complain to me. So now I'm sleeping one. So I'm still in Jake's um, code, recompiled it. And now notice, 
I have thread one, thread two, thread three, four, five, slowly ticking along, because I don't have any parallelism at all. So if I say pthread create, creates a thread, then immediately joins the thread without creating all the other threads first, I'm not running 15 threads at the same time. I'm running one thread, waiting for one thread to finish, running the second thread, waiting for the second thread to finish. So I don't actually get any speed up. I don't gain anything from this. And just to kind of show that we do have speed up, I'm going to bring back the for loop, the secondary for loop, to see what happens when we have the sleep. So bring this code back to what it was. Make it run it. Now they all sleep. We have that one second pause because they're all sleeping at the same time. And then we see a mess of output. And in fact, because they slept, and they all slept for one second, basically the sleep command says, hey, operating system, wake me up after one second. You see that it's actually in an even crazier different order. That we have now multiple things that are kind of racing to happen at the same time, and we get an even crazier order than we got with just p3 create. And in fact, sleep is an example of another blocking call. So the sleep command, it says, I'm going to sleep until for one second, an operating system, please wake me up after one second. Cool. Any question? Yeah. Is it possible to get parallelism and order at the same time? So that is going to be the challenge that we're going to try and achieve for the next three lectures. So the answer is, you can, there are ways you can kind of add, you can add blocks that basically says, and that's, we're going to talk about synchronization, where we can lock some state and say, we only want one person here at a time, or we want to wait until everyone gets to this point and then move forward. So there are different ways we can synchronize the threads, and we're going to learn three different strategies on how to do that, and there's three different techniques. But right now, with just basic threads, all we have the ability is to create a thread and then to join that thread back. And we got to make sure your create and your join should never, ever, ever be in the same for loop. You should always create your threads in one loop, join in a separate loop. Otherwise, you're just going to create the thread and join it right away, and you don't have parallelism. Yeah. Eyes on main stack, yeah. All threads only share their own stack. Only all threads share all of the same memory. They have the same address space, so they have the same ver they have the same page table. So when they look up an address, they're looking at the same page table. Each thread does get its own stack for thread start. Your thread start variables are private because that's your function. Every function you call after thread start, you have your own stack. But everything else is shared. Inside the thread start? In, everything inside the thread start is private. So in fact, if I say nj here and print out a pointer, I can see what is the memory address of j for all of these pointers. And let's so you'll see that all of these have so this is nine e so a e nine e a e e e b e f e so all of these pointers are different they all have their own stack and notice that these pointer addresses are very very large these are giant seven f f seven f five so these are giant addresses so these are stack addresses. Each of them have a different address because they have their own stack. So the operating system handles all that for us. The operating system promises that stack variables aren't going to, you're not going to override someone else's stack. Yeah, can it access somebody else's memory? Absolutely. 
Yeah. So you have the exact same memory space. Every single page that's accessible to one thread is accessible to all of the threads. Every thread, you share the entire page table. So, and in fact, if I look at, um, yeah, so basically if, if there's any global pointer, there's any global anything. So if I now, if I move int j to a global address, then now, as a global pointer, all of these have the exact same address. They're all 014. Because it's the same memory space. It's the same page table. All 15 of these threads point to the exact same memory that's storing now my global variable j. So the only thing that's private, the only private memory you have in a thread is the actual stack function or the stack memory of the actual thread function and any other functions you call from there. The main stack memory is shared because it's on the same page table. The stack memory of any functions that main calls before you create your thread, that's all shared. Your heap is entirely shared. You can access malloc regions from anywhere in your program in any thread. All of your memory is shared. You just get a little private stack space for yourself, but that address region is actually shared. So if you knew the stack address of your friend, you can go creep on your friend's data. So, um, and then the very last question, I think I've answered kind of four and five. I just want to answer six. What is the relationship between done and each, each thread running? What can we say? Is there a causal relationship between the two of those? Does one always happen before the other in this pthread join example? Is done always going to happen? Yeah. Exactly. So there's already one little bit of synchronization we have, which is the idea that we know that done must occur after all of the p thread, uh, or sorry, after all of the um, thread d running commands. Now, is there any, can we say anything about the relationship between thread one running and thread 15 or thread 14 running? Does thread one running always happen before thread 14 running? No, right? We don't know the relationship between one and 14. And actually thinking about this and thinking about how this synchronization works and how what order of things happen as you're dealing with threads is really, really, really important. And I think almost all of the prairie learning questions for the homework that's out today is entirely based on this, is entirely looking through code that's like 10 lines of code with pthread joins and pthread creates and deciding what guarantees do we have with the relationships of various different print lines. If I print out a number three inside the thread start function and number five before thread joins, do I have any guarantee that three or five is going to print first? Or could they print any, or are their order going to be determined at runtime? Because we know from this code that we always are going to get done at the very end. That that's going to be the last line to run. But we have no, pro and we know that all the other lines will run before done runs. But other than that relationship, we know nothing. So the Prairie Learn this week is all about thinking through those things. The last thing I want, so remember that homework three is due tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. If you haven't already done that, that deals with memory. And MP3, the extra credit part, which is parts one through four, you get 10 points of extra credit by getting that done by Friday, 11.59 p.m. And then you have that extra week to get all of MP3 done. So I'll be here afterwards for a few minutes if you have any questions. Otherwise, it was great to see you guys. Have an amazing weekend. And if you have a Mac, make sure to update MP3 to the latest code. The TA released an update that will help you guys run on Macs. So have a great weekend, and I'll be here if you have any questions.